Hey there! It's time for chapter three of our Lewis and Clark book. <clears throat> chapter four, I'm sorry, did I say chapter three? It's chapter four. And it's titled Ivory Combs and Calico Shirts. How do you pack for a trip that is going to take two and a half years and cover seven or eight thousand miles? Wow. Once you start, there will be no place to buy supplies. You must pack every single thing to buy or that you will need. You're, like, you're going to be like a ship on the ocean or a desert caravan. How do you begin? Well, Meriwether Lewis began with good rifles. He knew that powerful and accurate rifles in the hands of skilled hunters would mean a constant food supply. And rifles were important for self-defense as well. Lewis went to the U.S. Army's arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. There, he bought 15 long-barreled rifles. They were the first rifles especially designed for the Army. Such a rifle could bring down a deer at 200 yards. Lewis did much of his shopping in Philadelphia during the summer of 1803. He also did some studying there. From scholars in Philadelphia, Lewis learned how to classify plants and animals. He also learned how to determine where he was in the world by observing the stars. Lewis's shopping list included hundreds of pounds of flour, ground corn, and salt. He also bought a portable soup made of dried vegetables and other ingredients. By adding water to the mixture and boiling it, the explorers would get a hot meal. That's pretty smart. Lewis supervised as blankets, books, and clothing were packed in seven big bundles. He used oilskin bags to protect his scientific equipment. Such waterproof bags were also used for the journals that he and Clark planned to keep. Lewis purchased sheets of oilcloth. Each measured 8 by 12 feet. These were to be used as tents. <clears throat> Lewis also bought... 14 bales of gifts for the Native Americans. He knew that they wanted such items as glass beads, scissors, brass thimbles, sewing thread, knives, ivory combs, and calico shirts. Lewis also took along medals and certificates for Native American leaders. The United States had begun giving peace medals to the Native Americans as early as 1789. On one side, the medals carried a picture of the president. On the other side, they displayed a pair of clasped hands and the words, peace and friendship. And I'm going to show you that right now. So here are the medals that he gave out. Can you see them? So there's Thomas Jefferson, and there's the picture of the two clasped hands. Colorful ribbon was used in hanging the metal around one's neck. By the 4th of July, Lewis had finished his shopping and studying in, in Philadelphia. He set out across the Appalachian Mountains to Pittsburgh. There he was having a keel bo boat built. The keel boat was a type of boat often used on western rivers. The one that Lewis ordered was 55 feet long and 8 feet wide. Across the deck were sturdy benches. Along each side of the boat were large wooden lockers. The lids of the lockers could be raised for protection if the boat came under attack. Lewis had a small cannon installed at the boat's bow or front. So the bow is the, the front of the boat. It was mounted on a swivel. That way the cannon could be swung in one direction or the other. The keel boat was also fitted with a mast or a pole. So a mast goes way up. <clears throat> it was 32 feet high. The mast could be raised or lowered. When the wind was favorable, the crew raised the mast and hoisted a large square sail. Besides being rowed and sailed, the keel boat could also be poled. In poling, crew members stood 
and thrust long poles into the river bottom from the boat's bow. So imagine you're on a boat and there's no, let's say there's no wind. Well, you don't, certainly don't have a motor, of course. And I don't know if they had oars. Maybe we'll find out. But you have this big pole and you have it in your hands and you can push yourself along by pushing against the bottom of the riverbed and the, propelling yourself forward. Okay, that's what pulling is. They pushed hard, yeah, in pulling, crew members stood and thrust long poles into the river bottom from the boat's bow. They pushed hard on the poles as they walked toward the boat's stern. So they'd walk front to back. They'd, they'd grab it and then they'd push. The boat usually moved faster when it was being pulled than rowed. Okay, good to know. The expedition later added two smaller boats. These were sturdy, round-bottomed canoes. They were known as pirogues. By the end of August, work had been completed on the keel boat. Lewis started down the Ohio River in it. He picked up Clark in Clarksville, Indiana. Why do you think it's named Clarksville? <laughs> He also brought on board some of the first men who would be part of the expedition. The trip down the Ohio River was not easy. The water level was very low that summer. The men frequently had to pull and push the boat across ridges of sand. In some spots, they had to hire teams of horses or oxen to do the pulling. Because think about how much, how much equipment they had in those boats. They were heavy, right? So they can't just lift the boats over their head and walk across the sand dunes or the sandbars. When they reached the Mississippi River, they turned upstream. They kept paddling until they reached the Wood River, just north of St. Louis. There, they sent, set up winter quarters, quarters. The site is sometimes called Camp Du Bois. It is also called Camp Wood. Not far from their campsite, the captains could see the wide mouth of the Missouri River. Several weeks before the expedition set out, Lewis received disturbing news. Lewis had promised Clark that he would be made a captain. He and Lewis would then be of equal rank, but the request was not granted. Instead, the War Department made it clear that Clark would be a lieutenant. That was below Lewis's rank. Lewis was in St. Louis at the time. He wasted no time in writing to Clark at the Wood River camp. He told him the bad news. He added, I think it will be best to let none of our party or any other persons know anything about the grade or rank. So it was that the two men simply ignored what the War Department had done or had failed to do. During the long months of the expedition, the men never knew that, the, that Lewis actually outranked Clark. Both men were addressed as captains. Both men shared the leadership role through good times and bad. Now there's a picture in here that I want to show you, and I'm going to read the caption. So the caption is the writing that's underneath pictures. Okay, so I will read that to you. The Friends of Discovery at the Lewis and Clark State Park in Onawa, Iowa, constructed this replica of the explorer's keelboat. The boat is used in retracing their travels on the Missouri River. And here's the picture. So this is a replica. It's not, it's not the actual boat, but it looks like the kind of keelboat that Lewis and Clark would have used in their travels. And that's where I'll leave you. That was chapter four. I'll look forward to seeing you for chapter five.